my turn now. Merry Christmas. Man, it's good to see everybody in the room. How about this one? Feliz Navidad. Yeah. yeah. For my Portuguese speaking friends, Feliz Natal. Yeah. Yeah. And for my people, Buon Natale. Yeah. All right. Good. Let me stop before I get myself in trouble trying to hit other languages that I have no business speaking. But uh, hey, welcome to Christmas Eve service. We're glad you're in the room with us. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, my name's Phil. And I serve here as lead pastor, and it's a delight for us to be gathered on Christmas Eve. And uh, I know you have probably plenty of festivities planned today and tomorrow uh, and into the week as we celebrate the holidays and as we end uh, 2023. But thank you for taking some time to be with us uh, for this Christmas Eve service. Uh, we Normally it's a Sunday, but our services are in the morning. They'll be back to regular times next week for New Year's Eve. But just so thankful that you took some time to make this part of your Christmas celebration, time to worship Jesus together. And uh, if it's your first time with us as our guest, a special welcome to you. We're thrilled that you're in the room with us. Uh, for those of you that are joining us online, uh, hello to you as well. And uh, maybe it's your first time here in a really long time, so welcome back to you. We just hope that you are able to relax and receive what God has for you through the rest of the service. I saw some eager beavers ready to light those candles while we were singing. So just hang tight. We're going to do that at the end. I promise. I saw some people like, when's the fire coming? I promise the fire will come. And uh, we'll get to those uh, a little bit, a little bit later on um, towards the end of our service in just a bit here. But uh, again, just thrilled that you're with us. We'll close out with a time to worship the Lord through our giving. I know some of our church family giving towards our Christmas Kingdom Builders Christmas offering. You can certainly do that. And uh, we'll have a time too to get to respond to Jesus and what he's wanting to do, not just in this season, but in every season in our lives. Uh, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, and even if you haven't, we'll get you everybody on the same page here. We've been through this Christmas season, really through the month of December, talking about Jesus' four roles as Isaiah the prophet lays them out to us. And before we get to that in a couple of moments, I um, just want to remind us that if you think about it, Christmas begins with a look. Now, depending on when you like to celebrate Christmas, we have people in the room that are like day after Thanksgiving people, and we have people like Labor Day, we have some people like Christmas in July and just keep the stuff up the rest of the year. Wherever you fall on that Christmas celebration spectrum, here's what I know to be true, and that's this, that Christmas starts with a look. It might be few decorations. It may be some red and green or other associated Christmas colors for you. It may be with the trees that go up or an ad that you get in the mail or see on television, or even the first time walking into a store where the Christmas displays are up and are getting ready to move into that time of year. But it always begins with a look, Christmas trees, lights, tinsel, garland, wrapping paper, bows, whatever else comes with the territory of the holiday season. And Christmas, not just modern day, that begins with a look, but it's also began with a look hundreds of years, I don't know if you knew this, before Jesus was even on the scene. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet of old tells us a little bit about that, and he's going to share with us, I believe, the greatest Christmas passage ever in all of Scripture. Some would go right to the Gospels, and that makes sense. But uh, he explains to us what Jesus would come to do. However, just a couple chapters before that, in Isaiah chapter 7, he says these words to us. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And I want you to see this word, behold. Can you say behold? Behold. Behold. You see, we sang about that today. And in fact, on the way out today, we have a gift for you that's a Christmas ornament to commemorate this season that is the word behold on there, and then it'll say Christmas 2023. We have one for each family as a way to remember what we talked about today and really through this Christmas season. And he says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and his name shall be called. You shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us, God with us. So what I'm calling us to do in this season and for the little bit of time that we share together today on this Christmas Eve is for us to behold Jesus the way that Isaiah invites us to. You know, the word behold is another way of saying look. I mentioned to us a moment ago that Christmas always starts with a look, and so did this Christmas. Uh, hundreds of years before Christmas was actually a thing, before Jesus was born, Isaiah goes, hey, behold, behold. It's another way of us, we would say in modern day language, check this out. Like, don't, don't miss this. Come and see what's taking place right now. Don't miss this moment. Another meaning it has is to be sure to see what's taking place. 
It's easy in our world because of all the images that are flying at us all the time and how much of a visual culture we live in to miss certain things that perhaps pack even more meaning than others because we don't look at them for all that long, right? And Isaiah is calling our attention to, hey, there's going to be this child that's going to be born and he's going to be God with us, God among us, God to stay. And then it says this a couple of chapters later, Isaiah writes these words. He says, for to us, a child is born, a son is given. This speaks to both Jesus's humanity and his divinity, that he's man and God. And the government will be on his shoulders. And then watch this. He will be called and he gives him four titles that are really not just titles or positions, but responsibilities or roles that Jesus would come to fulfill. He says he'll be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. And through this month, we've been talking about a name each week leading up to today. And we've talked about how Jesus is wonderful counselor. It actually means literally in the Hebrew language in which it was written, one who is able to give miraculous direction or guidance. There are times in all of our lives, maybe you find yourself in a season right now where we can all use some miraculous God-given direction and guidance. And then Jesus would be the mighty God, mighty. He would come to be mighty to save and mighty to deliver and mighty to heal. And, and then we focused a little bit last weekend on him being the everlasting father, the one who knows how to care for and love and provide and protect his children by giving us his one and only son. And today it lands us on this Christmas Eve and throughout all of our services today with this title or this role of Prince of Peace. So I give to us today, behold the Prince of Peace. In other words, don't miss this. Don't miss Jesus as the Prince of Peace. And before we can really understand the totality of what he came to do, bringing peace to us, we need to understand a couple things about peace. And I want to talk for a few moments today together about peace that was defined. We have to understand what peace is, how it was disrupted, and then how Jesus came to restore it. So when we think about the first aspect of peace defined, it's really this idea of, well, what is peace? Now, if we were to give out some surveys today, hand you some paper or, or do it through an app, whatever you choose, and, and we ask you, hey, how would you define in a sentence or in a few words what peace is? We would probably have a variety of definitions, but I, I would guess that the majority of the room would get close to a definition of peace it, that's similar. It may sound something like calm or uh, the, the missing or, or void of tension or chaos or confusion. Maybe we would gather around that kind of definition and go, yeah, I'll sign up for that. But, but peace biblically is expressed a little bit differently than we would talk about it in our current time. In fact, I tend to think that most of us would think that if it could just get quiet a little bit, we'd sign up for that. Some of you already know the busyness of the season. In fact, some of you are thinking, hey, I'm good if we put Christmas away right now. It's already been confusing enough. Some, how many in the room still have some gifts to wrap tonight, right? Listen, enjoy some coffee on the way out. The caffeine may be needed later on this evening as you're finishing up those things, right? And some of you might be thinking, man, I, 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 just, I just wish in this season that there would be just some calm some peace, some quiet, because we tend to think of it externally. The story was told of a little girl who was at her dining room table and her dad walked in and she had papers scattered out all over the dining room table. Her dad says, sweetie, what are you doing? And she goes, dad, I'm, I'm coming up with a solution for world peace. And he goes, wow, that's a tall task for such a little girl. She goes, don't, don't fear, dad. My two friends at school are helping me do this. Right? As if she was going to solve it, what I'm sure she did not know is that down through the generations, statisticians have actually looked through all recorded history of mankind, and they came up, it's a wild stat, but they came up that only in all of human history that's on record, only 8% of the time has there been what we would say is world peace. In fact, during that time, there's been 8,000 treaties signed and people that have reneged on their commitment for peace on either end or both. And so when we think of it that way, if we're honest with ourselves, we tend to think of peace as being external, our surroundings, the things that are taking place around us. We think of peace when it comes to relationships like, hey, let's just keep the peace in the house or in the marriage or, or with our children or our extended family. But in God's kingdom, it works a little bit differently. It's really a peace that Jesus came to bring to us that works internally and from the inside out. Sure, it impacts and affects our surroundings and the environments in which we live, work, play, and study, but Jesus came to do a work on the inside of us. 
It was a world that when he came was expecting peace, much like each of us would describe it today. And like most of the world would, that he would come and, and, and war and then uh, the famine and, and starvation and that brokenness and bring healing. And he came to do that. However, it wasn't the fulfillment of all things quite yet. When he comes back a second time, that will be taken care of. But he comes to bring this internal peace that permeates our lives, that affects everything that we do and say, the relationships we're a part of, the work that we find ourselves doing. I like how Isaiah, several chapters later, mentions this. It's not a known Christmas passage, but in speaking about the peace that Jesus would bring, he says these words in Isaiah 26, you, meaning God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are fixed on you, those that trust you. Now, it's interesting, in the original language, there is no word for perfect there. In fact, Isaiah writes it, and it's literally translated as, he, God, will give you peace, peace. But grammatically, the English translators, like, twitched at that. They're like, it doesn't make sense grammatically. We can't put that in there. We have to figure something out. How are we going to put peace, peace? So they came up with perfect peace. And really, the meaning behind it is this, that it's peace compounded. It's peace squared. It's peace that can't be measured or quantified. That's the kind of peace that Jesus came to bring. That's the kind of peace that he is, and he brings to us himself, this, this prince of peace, the one who would come and not just point us to peace or be an importer from heaven to earth of peace, but really he came to rule and to lead our hearts as prince of peace. See, it's interesting. Isaiah didn't use any other. He didn't say he's the giver of peace or the deliverer of peace. I'm sure you had a lot of packages showing up at your home the last few weeks. Like, I think the FedEx guy is on our family payroll. He's been to the house so many times, right? My goodness. And, uh, and you might think, well, Jesus came just to deliver peace, but he came to be the prince of it so that a prince can rule or lead over the peace in our lives. So there was peace the way God defined it, this idea of shalom, peace that would be whole and would bring harmony and would bring completeness. That's the way the Bible defines what Jesus was coming to bring us. But then peace got disrupted. Most of us know the story of how sin entered the world. We'll find it in the third chapter of Genesis, and we realize that when the enemy in the form of a serpent came to Eve and presented her to eat one fruit so that she could be like God, the only fruit in the entire Garden of Eden that God said was off limits, and she did. She shared with her husband. They fall into sin, and all of a sudden, shame comes flooding into their lives. I don't know if you knew this, but in your Bible, there are 1,189 chapters in Scripture, and there's only four of them. Where there's a perfect world. In the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, and in the end, in Revelation 21 and 22. The other 1,185 chapters, the story of redemption and Jesus desiring to bring peace. Because of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 8 just for a moment. We have to understand how it was disrupted. It says, when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking together in the cool of the day in the garden, they had already eaten the fruit, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. Why? Because it was in that moment that peace was disrupted by eating the fruit that God instructed them, the only thing he told them that they couldn't do, and sin enters the world. And now they recognize that with sin comes shame and comes guilt. And they're in this place of going, oh my goodness, we need to run and hide because this relationship of being able to talk to God on a regular basis was disrupted. And I don't know if you've experienced this in your life, but there are times when we sin and we fall short of God's glory, like Romans teaches us, and we realize that shame and the guilt come flooding in. It's not shame and guilt from the Lord. He brings conviction in order to invite us to a place of understanding and receiving his peace. However, the shame and guilt come as byproducts of our disruption of peace, of our willingness to step into sin and to go against the authority of who God is and who he wants to be in our lives. They traded his peace for just a few moments of pleasure, and it was their disobedience that inter interrupted or uh, disrupted all all of the peace that, that they understood in the garden. And when I think about that, I think of how Jesus follows up to it. You fast forward from Genesis chapter three all the way to the gospel of John. Jesus says these words as he's out walking and talking and teaching with the disciples. And he says something so profound. He says, peace, I leave with you. Why could he do that? How does he have the authority to do that? Well, he is the prince of peace. 
He has the authority to leave his peace with them, to give his peace to them. And he says this, I do not give peace as the world gives. I'm talking about a wholeness, a completeness, Jesus is saying. And then he gives this command, do not let, do not let what? Do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. The problem is for all of us as part of human condition and the human experience is our hearts get troubled and fear comes and strikes us and grips our hearts and we let fear sneak in in such a way that it causes a disruption of the peace that Jesus has already given to us. And our minds start going crazy and we start living a little bit outside of the intended design that God has for us. I think of a story I heard some time ago about a man who went to see a psychiatrist and as he was going to see his psychiatrist, he gets there and just kind of disheveled and a little bit of a mess. And the doctor says, well, hey, what's what's going on? He says, well, doc, listen, it's been going on for a while and, and I'm in serious help in trouble. I need some help. And he says, well, what's taking place? He said, well, every night when I put my head down on the pillow, I feel like someone's getting underneath my bed. So it startles me. So I get down out of bed and I go look underneath it and I'll stay down there for a little bit. But then a few moments later, it feels like someone's laying on top of my bed. So I'll jump out from underneath and get back on top. And I do this all night down, up, down, up, down, up. He says, is there any cure for this? Is there any way that you can help me? The doctor looks at him and he goes, I, I think, I think I can. It's going to mean you coming twice a week for the next two years at $75 a copay for about $15,000. And I think I can provide a solution. So the man looks at the doctor and he says, well, that's kind of steep for a working man like me. Let me go home and consult my wife for the married men in the room. Always a good idea, right? Consult your wife. So he goes home. He talks to his wife about it. She thinks the price is outlandish. He calls the doctor back a week later and he says to the psychiatrist, listen, that price is really steep. My wife isn't on board with it. And by the way, she's already solved the problem. He goes, well, what did she do? He said she saw the legs off the bed. So now nobody can get underneath it. And as cute and funny as that story is, here's what Jesus came to do by delivering peace to us. He came to saw the legs off of worry and all the things that concern us in order for us to live at peace because it was disrupted. And that's the third aspect of what we need to talk about today before we light candles in a moment. Well, how was it restored to us? How did Jesus restore peace? How did he come and fix all of it? In the gospel of Matthew, we fast forward now from Isaiah several hundred years and it says these words, you'll remember this word, won't you? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. A couple gospel accounts later in Luke's version of the story, he says something similar about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. He says, glory to God in the highest. These are the angels and the heavenly host are now singing glory to God in the highest and what? And peace among those with whom God is pleased. That Jesus is here, the birth of the child is announced, it's taken place right in front of them, and he came to bring them peace. And that same Jesus that was born a couple thousand years ago that we celebrate on this wonderful Christmas Eve and in this special service is here today to still bring peace into our lives. And I just want to encourage you with this truth that we've already established and talked about for a few moments, that Jesus isn't just looking to drop peace off to you. He's looking to restore it in a way as to where he'll be with you. And he's not a God that is just with us for a season. Know that friend. Listen, he's not Emmanuel with us, God with us for Christmas or until everything's packed away in a couple of weeks. He's not just Emmanuel, God with us as far as we're celebrating with family and friends or sitting here in this service. He's Emmanuel that came to be God with us and to stay with us. Now those words behold that Isaiah talked about on a couple of occasions that the gospel writers confirmed and reaffirmed by stating behold this child who is foretold is now here Jesus himself in the very last book of your Bible in Revelation chapter 3 if you have a red letter edition Jesus's words will be in red there and he says these words to one of the churches that he's walking among in verse 20 of Revelation 3 he says this behold I Stand at the door and knock. Hey, behold, come, come see this. Check this out. Be sure that you don't miss it. Isaiah spoke of him. Matthew and Luke, the gospel writers, spoke of beholding Jesus. And now Jesus says of himself, hey, don't, don't miss me. I stand at the door of your life and I knock. And if you'll hear my voice threefold, if you'll hear my voice and you'll open the door, 
then I'll come in and we can eat together. And I think it's a beautiful picture of what this Christmas season is about. You don't normally hear that verse per se in a Christmas message. But when I was thinking about that the last couple of weeks, I thought, look how the Lord brought that full circle. It was foretold of him centuries before he was born. And then years after his death and resurrection, his ascension back to the Father, he tells the church in Revelation through the Apostle John that, behold, I'm standing at the door and knocking. I'm inviting myself into your life. And the thing I love about the Prince of Peace, about Jesus himself, is that he's taken the first step and the second step, and he keeps taking steps again and again and again to initiate relationship with us. So how do you know that? Well, the verse proves it right there in Revelation 3. I stand at the door and I knock. And he's knocking to come into our lives. This is usually a part of the message where somebody will say, he's knocking on the door of your heart. But I want to I want to I want to alter that a little bit and and submit this to us that he's knocking on the door of our lives because Jesus doesn't just want to come into your heart. He wants to come into all of you. And one of the dangers, I think, of the Christmas season is if we just respond to Jesus out of the emotion of the moment or a service, it'll be powerful in a few moments. Candles will be lit. It's a special time as we sing Silent Night. It's always one of the most beautiful times of any service throughout the year. But if we just let it connect with our heart only and not him come into all of our lives, we'll miss the peace that he's wanting to restore. We'll miss him being the Prince of Peace and ruling over all of our lives our heart, our soul, our bodies, our decisions, our relationships, our careers, you fill in the blank. And so that promise is threefold. Here's our response. We need to hear his voice. And some of us will hear it in this season. Some of us will hear it and then the noise of the holidays, the noise of kids unwrapping presents tomorrow or for the next several days, the families gathering. It'll be a little bit more challenging to hear Jesus's voice. It's still there. It's still as loud as it's ever been. He's always inviting us into ongoing relationship, but it'll be easy after the holidays for us to just kind of turn his voice down. And so I want to encourage you to not do that wherever you find yourself in relationship with God today. And then not just hearing him, but also keeping the door open. It's not just opening the door up once. There are a lot of people in the world, listen, that have no problem opening the door to Jesus, but they're also okay with closing it in a few days. Unfortunately, when all the decorations are put in boxes and bins and put away in the garage or the attic or wherever you store them, we tend at times to pack Jesus away too until they come back out the end of next year. And so we hear his voice and, and we open the door and then he says this, and I love this part, and we're going to pray in a second, that I'll come in and I'll eat with them. The heart of that verse is this idea that we're going to stay and I didn't just come to be God with you for a moment or for a meal or for a day, but I'm going to continue to be with you as Emmanuel. I'm the God who's here to stay if you'll let me. And so if Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he's also Emmanuel, God with us, it's fair for us to deduce this, that peace can be with us all the time, all the time. And you don't have to forfeit it regardless of what's taking place outside around you, regardless even sometimes of the storm that rages within each one of us, if we're willing to hear his voice, to open the door of our lives, and to let him in, he'll come and he'll reside where he's welcome. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to pray for us just in this moment of personal reflection. That's why we ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes to, as best you can, just kind of close off everything around you. Father, we're so grateful for the greatest gift ever given your son. We're going to exchange gifts these next few days. Some of us already began that. And Lord, as we, as we do so, we're reminded of the greatest gift that's ever been given and certainly the best gift ever received. We thank you, Father, for giving your only son, Jesus. And Jesus, you didn't just come so we can celebrate in a candlelight service once a year. You came to live with us, to be God with us, to be Prince of Peace, the one who dwells and stays with us. So God, I pray that for each heart here, that we'd be mindful of continuing to hear your voice, continuing to open the door to you so that you'll come and you'll live among us, that you'll be part of our lives day in and day out. And if you're here today, listen, friend, if you're here today and your heart, maybe it's far from God, you understand that peace was disrupted when sin entered the world. You know this because our hearts are, are made to follow our creator, that that. Each of us have sinned and we fall short of God's standard. 
We could never get back to him, but he made a way. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas. He made a way by sending the one who can put us at peace with our creator, his son, Jesus, who took our sin on the cross. Jesus was born to die so that you can live. It's an incredible thought. And so if you're here today and you're far from God, but want to give your life to him, you want to open the door of your life to Jesus because you hear his voice today. It's been made clear to you. You want to invite him in. I would love to pray with you in this moment. Not going to take long, just with heads bowed, to know that I can include you in that prayer. Would you just slip up your hand long enough for me to see? You say, that's me today, Phil. Just need to invite him into my life. Yeah, bless you. Awesome. Two, three, four. Hands sprinkled throughout the room. Balcony. God bless you guys. And so you can pray something like this. You don't have to repeat my words. It's not, it's not the words that are important. It's the posture of our heart. But something along these lines. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I've sinned and I've missed the mark of your perfect standard, but you came so that I can be made new. You came to be born in a manger and to die on a cross so that I could live not just now, but for all of eternity with you, You've taking my sin on you. And I believe that what you did on the cross in my place was sufficient to pay for every one of my sins, past, present, and future. And Lord, we invite you in this moment to come into our lives and to take up residence there, God, to be Emmanuel, God with us, to be the Prince of Peace. Thank you for restoring peace between us and the Father. And Lord, I pray that as you're doing that right now, you would assure each person who's confessing you as Lord and as Savior in this moment, assure them of this free gift of your salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.